to welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor Channel. We're going to go over the first quarter 2022 conference call together. Um, I thought it was a good quarter. I really did. I think there was some real telling pieces that came out of the Q&A session, uh, where investor analysts' uh, minds are, where the institutions are, and um, just really what it meant for the progress of the company. And I, I think that's really the, the, the framework that I would like investors to take away from what they were able to generate in Q1 in 2022. I thought there was uh, some real marked progress. I think this was a sign and an indication that this company uh, is far removed of the company that uh, we were uh, uh, monitoring just 12 short months ago uh, and the progress that they've made along their timeline, especially with all of the headwinds that have um, really plagued this company. Uh, since coming to public markets and you know I, I release this content on about a weekly basis to try to really highlight the company and highlight the company progress uh, as uh, new developments have come to play and um, there was really in this investor slide deck here in covering the first quarter call uh, in combination in what was uh, discussed at the ACT Expo uh, as well as what was discussed do during the Q&A. I think if you put those th three things together, there was a lot that is going on here. On the macroeconomic perspective here with the trucking industry as a whole, the addressable market that Hylion is looking to go after, um, the interest in fleets and is just only growing with electrification and, and um, really solidifying that interest through the ride and drive program. You know, I was kind of like, eh, I, I shook it off when I heard about it. And, you know, there were fleets that went down there for the ride and drive that nobody knew about, uh, only Hylion knew about. And, uh, you know, that that's exciting to know that these fleets are serious about it. They know that the decisions that they make here and who they choose as their solution of choice is really going to um, be, uh, it's be, going to be paramount in how they stack up against the industry as the industry is uh, not only electively uh, transitioning, but also forcefully, uh, for a lack of better terms, in certain uh, situations with regard to the advanced clean fleet initiatives and the OEM mandates that Thomas Healy talked about actually on the on the call itself. Um, these are just the highlights from the call as presented by Hylion, but I thought I would go through it with you guys as a group uh, and give you my insights on what I picked out of the uh, Q1 call for 2022. So we had some insights from the ACT Expo uh, talking about how successful the ride and drives uh, were at the ACT Expo. There were multiple customers in the truck at the same time uh, taking fleet ride and drives, some of an extended nature. Um, I was actually invited this year to the ACT Expo, so a little bit different uh, approach this year uh, in um, really enjoying the progress of this company and how it's evolved over time. And uh, the sky's the limit here. I tell you what, you know, as we look at this company just being really brand new to uh, public markets. Uh, the company's been around about seven years, but really in the public uh, limelight here for two of those years uh, and really has entered into what has been kind of a, a tough a tough market uh, with a lot of geopolitical influences going on, uh, the volatility in fuel prices, uh, non-availability of the product itself due to uh, supply chain issues. Um, all of those things the company will eventually fight through. Those things eventually will die out. Um, how long that's going to take is, is anybody's guess, but the more churn uh, that is generated over this uh, topic with regard to supply chain will only prove to be tailwind once things do uh, soften up and the supply chain does open up uh, and becomes less of an issue in turning out their product. But it was kind of a running joke as to the uh, plug-in availability of the uh, plug-in dependent ride and drives. Uh, there was some fighting going on with the uh, plug-in availability, which is probably on a, on a low scale, uh, micro scale, speaking to the macro uh, concerns that Hylion and Thomas Healy are quick to identify with. And um, kind of kind of a running joke there in that the Hypertruck ERX suffered no such uh, no such shortcoming there as they are free of the grid and the restrictions that could exist there uh, and being subject to the grid and the um, lack of availability of fuel from the grid. So um, pretty pretty cool stuff as um, the Hypertruck uh, continues to impress uh, and continues to garner its due attention in a one trillion 
dollar addressable market here with 300,000 trucks being renewed every single year globally. Um, I, the question is where uh, Hylion will find its place in the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the presentation here uh, specific to the Q1 call. So highlights here, uh, 170 Hypertruck orders for production slots in Q1. This is almost double uh, from what was reported last time with 100. Uh, this is marked progress toward that end. And, you know, I, I want you guys to really put this into context. Had they come out and they did not add to this at all, which is a, a distinct possibility, um, they didn't. Uh, they almost doubled it. So when people are talking about um, not progressing toward an end or, or, or not selling product, these are um, orders that are backed by deposits, yes, but they, they need to be looked at a little bit different. Here's the thing, guys. If I was a fleet, I would not uh, I would not devote to this. I would not make this commitment. And there's a lot of fleets out there um, that will not commit until this product is ready, number one. And number two, they've had a chance to validate it within their fleets, okay? So there might be a 50, 100, 250, 500 truck order down the line. They may only start with one. Thomas Healy has talked about this many, many times. And for 170 hyper truck orders to be garnered at this point with the product still 18 months from even starting to ramp up production is impressive, okay? It's not to be dismissed. Uh, the market is dismissing this, and then you go below the surface and you look at the interest garnered on the 2,000 unit reservations to date. These are two quantifiable metrics that we will look to embolden, we will look to uh, uh, grow upon going forward uh, as the subsequent quarters are reported on, but I take this to be a step in the right direction and an awful big one at that. So. The Hypertruck ERX expected to qualify for the full credit with the advanced clean fleet uh, program mandated for fleets. This is basically that incentive that I've been talking about on the channel for uh, many, about, about a year or more uh, on that incentive. And it's something that we did not have color around when we first started covering Hylion. Uh, they're now starting to talk about this as a real driving force. Now, this almost solidifies that break-even for fleets. In other words, is Hylion going to have a place in the industry? Well, this kind of answers it for us. If there's going to be a, a requirement or a mandate, it at least brings Hylion in the discussion. Uh, it does not guarantee that Hylion is the solution of choice. However, uh, that's really where your choice in an investor comes in to say, look, do I believe in the Hylion product or not? Um, <clears throat> you're at liberty to do whatever you'd like with regard to where you put your conviction on uh, what product fleets are going to, uh, to, to choose. But it would be irresponsible to suggest that somehow Hylion will not be in the discussion uh, to somehow benefit from these ACF mandates for the fleets and will highlight uh, the OEM requirements as well. So there's going to be a double whammy. Fleets are going to be expected not to use the excuse anymore to not step into uh, an electrified future, whether it be BEV, whether or not it be the Hypertruck ERX, uh, which does qualify, uh, as well as you know OEMs to actually make sure that before that product is even delivered to fleets, uh, that they're meeting those uh, minimum standards for mandates. Will companies go over? Yeah, I believe that they will. And I believe they'll work toward, toward at least making those uh, minimum uh, fleet goals a reality within the time frame specified under the ACF program, all right? Um, Hypertruck ERX commercialization milestones achieved, so following along uh, those timelines, giving us an idea of when certifications, when fleet demos are going to be made available, uh, hybrid EX uh, deliveries do continue. Um, I thought that the 340,000 in revs were, was good. I, I thought that, you know, for a product that's being kind of um, kind of looked at as a bridge to electrification for fleets and the full Hypertruck ERX product, I think to generate 340000 in revenues was actually very positive and uh, looked to improve upon that. Uh, Sherry Baker added a little bit of color on this uh, during the Q&A, talking about an accelerated pace of those revenues. Where it shakes out right now is about $1.6 million on this uh, current trajectory. So to get them to that 2 to $3 million, they're going to have to 
uh, grow upon those revenues, and Sherry Baker alluded to that being the reality of the situation, uh, is that those revenues should expand quarter over quarter as we approach uh, the end and close out 2022 into the subsequent quarters. So um, it'll be nice to see that they're uh, continuing to accelerate that, but you know, to double up all of last year's uh, year-end revenues, I, I thought was a positive. And then, of course, the $527 million on the balance sheet. Um, we know that Hylian is well positioned uh, in their uh, cash and cash equivalents uh, to continue to fund their business plan over the next 18 months to get them to that uh, entry commercialization stage and um, really garner that fleet interest enough to where we're going to approach that critical mass uh, of, of number of trucks that uh, are needed to sustain the business over the long term. So progressing along the timeline is is key here. I this is really nice. This is um, adds a, a lot of um, granularity around the roadmap coming for um, the Hypertruck ERX status and and where they see the fleet developing in light of the supply chain issues that have been um, uh, earmarked as being a, a a large headwind in delivering these trucks. And it's not just about Hylion, it's about slowing down the entire production chain where, you know, uh, uh, trucks that can't be delivered in front of uh, a Hylion truck or, you know, a, a specific part that may be due, may be affecting uh, the entire industry uh, and therefore having a trickle down uh, type of impact to everybody that's involved in the space uh, needing these same components. But um, obviously progressing along their timeline, uh, I'll, I'll be monitoring this to make sure that at least they're staying on pace just from a uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an investor's perspective, looking in at what the company is projecting to us as to what they see. Some of the things here to note, start on road testing of des design verification vehicles. They've already got those build slots um, all reserved and ready to go uh, to deploy the vehicles into controlled fleets. That'll be the back half of this year alone. Winter half, uh, winter testing starting back half of this year and going into uh, probably the January and February months as appropriate. And then uh, the NHTSA, EPA, and CARB certifications. Thomas Healy spoke about this on the transcript as well. Um, that's going to be a huge, huge milestone. And, and it, it's just going to be one step closer in uh, meeting these time timeline milestones and, and approaching this uh, inevitable uh, 2023 uh, uh, ramp up to uh, commercialization for the fleets. I review uh, slide information like this for uh, as an investor's perspective, and I, I just I couldn't be more happy with the progress. This is incredible. Um, the fleet mandate uh, new, <laughs> and the OEM mandate uh, expected to qualify for 75% of ZEV credits. You know, it's going to be nice to see what that looks like on the bottom line. Um, is, is that going to be um, incentive credits for fleets to look at the Hylion solution and be provided uh, a bottom line uh, cost savings of 75%? Um, for those of you guys who may understand that a little more than me, I'm looking at it at the surface and I, I'm just, I, I'm looking at this as a game changer. I, I, I don't know how to look at it any other way. And it's amazing to me how I hear some of the bear cases. And this is why a lot of the reason why I do this every week is because I don't hear people talking about the same stuff that I'm talking about. And, you know, if the continued uh, stock uh, really continues to get no favor in the marketplace, we're going to continue to highlight these incredible milestones here with the with the company and the regulatory involvement and oversight in this is something that I earmarked with covering highly on a long, long time ago. Over 12 months ago, I talked about the importance of the, the, the national and local governments stepping in and assisting with providing incentive. And you look at it from the, the perspective, I'm not looking at, at subsidizing this entire thing from the government. I'm not like that. I'm much more conservative in my approach. What I am looking at is a, an assistance to say, look, if 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 the green initiative is something that we want to move forward for, and I think there's a lot of people out there that would agree, it's something that we need to really start to talk seriously about, then provide some incentive to these industries that are looking to make the transition and maybe taking on a little bit more of a risk with new technology and, 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 and uh, supplementing old 
uh, um, uh, assurances through the diesel application with new technology and providing that that assistance to say, look, if you're willing to take this leap of faith into new technology, then we're going to step in and we're going to help you subsidize that. This is huge. And, and Hylion is going to be right there at the forefront uh, as a solution that these companies are going to look at and say, man alive, we can go BEV over here. Maybe we can do a Tesla application here. You know, maybe a Nikola fits or a, 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 a Hyzon type of application, but maybe even the hybrid e, uh, hybrid product, the hybrid EX, and then the Hypertruck ERX fits. And this is going to really kind of force the hand of industry to really evaluate the lines that they run and really look to say, okay, you know, we've run diesel on this line. Is this eligible to to upgrade? And I do consider this an upgrade. And, and so it's not going to be so much highly on selling this product to fleets, rather making it available to fleets to meet these mandates. And if, if you're not excited about this, guys, you're not looking at the right things. And if you don't think I'm looking at the right things, please tell me. But when I looked at this right here, this is huge. This is a twofold, hey, we need to get serious about this, both from the fleet perspective and from the OEM uh, perspective to make sure that the mandate to the OEMs to say, look, man, the number of rigs that you turn off the line has to be a certain number of uh, of, of low carbon footprint types of products. You're not going to be able to just continue to provide these diesel uh, fossil fuel dominant options when there's optionality out there in the marketplace. I could understand it if solutions didn't exist, but you wonder why I'm such a a convicted bull on Hylion, this is why eventually Hylion will get their look from fleets. And it's my conviction to suggest that these fleets are going to take more of a convicted look at this as opposed to maybe even more of a, of a viable solution for them as they introduce the Hylion solution to their lines. So a couple things I'll highlight on this slide. It's amazing to me how many customers uh, Hylion has been able to garner interest from uh, as we've evolved in this. And, you know, it's interesting. We had our group of uh, fleets out there when we first started covering Hylion, and it has changed. Uh, it has grown, uh, and it has grown in, um, in epic fashion. And as these initial fleets and through the Hypertruck Innovation, uh, Innovation Council it are, are put out into the fleet slowly through fleet demos, I, I think the secondary market here is something to be discussed. And specifically, I want to touch on Green Path Logistics, who drives for both Amazon and UPS and many, many others. Green Path Logistics is a big player in the space. You don't think that there's going to be a trickle-down type of effect once these companies start to realize the bottom line benefit uh, to their bottom line to suggest that these uh, other companies aren't going to take note. Uh, I, I think that's um, a really interesting angle to look at this opportunity. When we're talking about highly on garnering this much interest this early in the game, and it is early, and these companies are already jockeying for position and strong fleet experiences at Hypertruck ERX ride and drive events. It's a very, very vague statement put out by Hylion, and it doesn't speak to the amount of fleets that went to the ride and drive event and did not want to be named. Competition is fierce. There are certain fleets out there that do not want other fleets to understand where they are putting their loyalty. In other words, if they're looking at Hylion as a viable solution, they certainly don't want to be beat out if other uh, competition is looking at what they are looking at and then trying to anticipate, like a chess move, what moves they're going to make and when. Okay, And this is part of the churn that's going on right now, and it's, start, it's really a big uh, piece of the uh, momentum that's being uh, created right now. And... You know, at some point, this momentum is going to snowball and it's going to be guys like myself who sit on the sideline and calmly watch this momentum catch uh, the snowball effect down the hill as it, it runs away from itself. Because when the floodgates open and this company is uh, providing availability for these products, which I don't want to have happen now, 
I mean, what's the big deal if we get a 10,000 order from Amazon right now? Yeah, the stock would pop, but we're still in the same situation by not being able to fill those orders. The way I look at this is very, very simple. This, to me, almost doubling the orders to 170, and these are orders that are backed by deposits from 100 that were announced last quarter. This suggests to me that even as early as we are in this game, multiple fleets are out there and they are ready to take this leap of faith. This is without fleet validation and this is without the uh, required certification uh, that Hylion has earmarked for the first part of next year. These are without these things. So for these fleets to make, be making these uh, assurances now, uh, forecasting that down the line, they are going to be the recipient of some of these very, very first trucks and start to enjoy that bottom line TCO right, up, right away is a bullish sign. It's just that simple. And amazing to me how many uh, orders they've been able to secure. Now, it gives us a metric to be drawn upon for follow-on quarters to track this uh, Q1 orders for 170 as we build upon that. I'd like to see that get up to 500 or 1,000. Why not? Uh, why not? I think that the truck fleet is so big, and I think if the interest is so robust that Hylion would suggest, there's no reason to believe that this uh, backlog of orders backed by deposits can't grow significantly as we approach this 2023 milestone uh, of commercialization. Uh, simple bullets here in highlighting the 340,000 of hybrid EX uh, sales during the quarter. Continue to see market demand as fleets transition to alternative power generation. We'll see. Um, the bears would say, look, Hylian has done nothing so far. Uh, I beg to differ. I think they're approaching this end. Uh, I, I don't think they're lying. I, I am uh, convicted on the interest that I presume to be uh, of interest in the fleets. I believe that there's incentive enough and in some cases mandates for the fleets to change. Now the question is where is Hylion going to fit into this equation? Well that's anybody's guess but you know is it going to be nothing? Well, I don't know. I think it takes more imagination to imagine that they're not going to get any piece of this pie. Um, I would suggest perhaps maybe the way things are shaping up, Hylion may get a bigger piece to the pie than what they're being provided credit for now in the open marketplace. But it's anybody's guess to see uh, how much of this addressable market Hylion is going to be able to garner uh, as their product, especially the Hypertruck ERX, uh, comes to market uh, and becomes available to fleets. Um, in the meantime, uh, Hylion has uh, pledged their commitment to continuing to fight this supply chain issue that is continuing to loom, uh, which is continuing to persist in the industry. And um, I'm of the impression that they're doing everything they can do to try to combat this. There's no reason to su suggest that they are not. Uh, and there's no reason to suggest that these aren't uh, alive and well, and that Hylion is just taking this on the chin right now and, and incurring uh, some slowdown uh, within their supply chain. And um, I, I, we're just going to continue to monitor this. And the longer it persists, the more back pressure it will provide to where when it does uh, relinquish itself and, 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 and um, the supply chain does uh, open up, it's going to create a tailwind, uh, and the um, you know what was a concern, uh, an indefinite concern, is now going to dissolve away. And I, I think the stock should uh, react to that news very, very positively when it does happen. But it has not happened uh, just yet. So this slide is a tier two uh, uh, kind of a dual application here, and, and Thomas Healy spoke about this during the call actually where they were looking at long-term opportunity with um, uh, uh, additional revenue streams. I, I, it got my attention. Uh, I've been talking about this for a long, long time, uh, looking to take their battery solution to the next level, their proprietary battery solution at that, uh, and find other use cases for it, as well as their advanced software solutions. And um, if I was going to give Hylion the um, benefit of the doubt, here, here's my thought. I believe that Hylion is looking to partner with and collaborate with industry and not just sell them product. Um, I believe that they are really looking to take on a customer for life 
um, whether or not that is what ends up being uh, in the in in the relationship between industry and Hylion is yet to be seen. I think once those relationships are fortified, I think we're going to understand a lot more with regard to their software solutions uh, as more of a subscription-based reoccurring revenue stream, and that. The Hypertruck ERX here that is really, uh, I want you guys to understand this is a three-tier application. Now, one thing that, uh, that kind of gets me um, is the bullish conviction around hydrogen fuel cell. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I've done a lot of research on hydrogen fuel cell, and I don't really see why everybody is chalking this up as to be the end-all, be-all solution of the future. Uh, I actually think Thomas Healy knows this. Um, and I think he's playing a little bit of um, of uh, a little bit of gamesmanship right here. I do. Uh, I think he knows how robust RNG is going to be into the future. I think he alludes to this when he talks about hydrogen fuel cell as being the solution uh, that is 10 years away, and it's been 10 years away for the last three decades. I think that really is telling. However. With the R&D that is going into the creation of the hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cell truck and the fuel agnostic truck, I, I think the way I look at this as a, a, a optionality for fleets, I really do. I think if they have the opportunity down the line at some indetermined amount of uh, date into the future to have a hydrogen fuel cell as part of their lines, uh, I believe that they'll opt for that. With that said, I don't think RNG is going away. I don't think compressed natural gas is going away, depending on availability there of the infrastructure. And then a fuel agnostic option, that sounds incredible. It sounds like the fleets have the ability to go back and forth on what bottom line TCO fuel is going to provide them the biggest benefit. It makes simple sense to me. Um, wouldn't that be great to be able to choose between RNG or where the hydrogen fuel cell costs have come down so significantly that maybe even it's more advantageous to run the hydrogen fuel cell uh, as opposed to the RNG, or maybe they want to run the hydrogen fuel cell to get the research and development and the performance data out of it? There's all kinds of different optionality hypothesis that can be drawn by the opportunity Hylion has here to generate revenues in, in not just the way that they projected in the short to medium term. Uh, uh, Thomas Ely did uh, allude to this as well on the call where he talked about the primary focus of the company right now um, on the Hypertruck ERX. And I think that is prudent, uh, but I think it's also smart to introduce some of those other options that they are exploring uh, at this particular juncture. So it's still solid on the financials. I mean, this is pretty um, pretty easy here. No debt. Um, uh, total liquidity, $527 million, uh, comprised of short and long-term investments and cash on hand, uh, which Sherry Baker has uh, alluded to being plenty to fund their business plan going forward. That was uh, all the initial goal uh, is right now. We are in the early stages of this company uh, in public markets. Yes, the company is seven years old. Um, I totally understand that, but it is new to public markets here, and it has accelerated uh, uh, immensely over the last two years. Thomas Healy talks about this. You can hardly recognize the company anymore, and uh, how exciting should this be for, for a guy that started this company from uh, inception to see where it is right now, 18 months sh uh, uh, shy of seeing this uh, first commercial iteration of the Hypertruck ERX uh, is just fabulous, and it's to be commended. It's a, a, a true success story. It really is, and um, it, it's really going to be told that way in 18 months. Nobody wants to tell that story right now, except for me, uh, because I don't look at this company as a $3 company. I look at it like a $60 company and above. Um, certain uh, milestones will uh, allow the company to grow into that valuation, as well as some additional evolutions going forward as they uh, go global uh, and go over after this addressable market that we talk about all the time. And uh, now we're talking about a $100 plus company. So uh, I look at it that way. I look at it that way now. I'll look at it that way into the future. When this thing is a $20 stock, I will look at it as a $100 company. When this thing is 50 and 75, it will be the same. 
Uh, but when we're looking at this company on the onset, revenues in between two to three is somewhat immaterial at this point. Uh, it just shows marked progress toward the end. Operating expenses just over uh, 25.6 million for the quarter. Uh, total operating expenses for the year here uh, in between 135 and 145. Uh, so it does speak to the cash burn a little bit. It will be interest of interest to monitor, of course, as any prudent investor should. Uh, but to value the company right now is really, really trick tricky. And I think it's somewhat futile, to be honest with you, because uh, by certain metrics, you could still argue that the company is overvalued. You could. Um, I'm not one in that camp. I know the metrics that they're using, and I think it's an unfair metric. Um, I think that metric right now takes into consideration that the company makes zero money and that their cash burn is, uh, you know, $135 million on the low end. Uh, and that, you know, where is that expected payoff? It takes some imagination to uh, presume that they're going to make sales enough to hit that break even uh, critical mass to cover expenses. So I, I, I don't think that's why investors are investing in this company. Uh, investors are investing in this company for the prospects of penetrating a $1 trillion uh, industry in the Class 8 space and, and really not seeing a whole lot of competition out there. Uh, when we look at the trifold benefit of fuel, of uh, payload capacity, and the uh, initiatives, and now, dare I say, mandates to go green. And uh, if you're looking outside or looking beyond the Hylion uh, solution, uh, I think that's a fallacy on your end. And I think you need to take a double back. And I think you need to look at what this company brings to bear here uh, as we uh, evolve toward and march toward commercialization. Well, so if the time for electrification is now, um, then, you know, it, what what does now mean? Um, I, I think this speaks to the industry's uh, acceptance to, to, to talk, uh, to begin collaboration, uh, to start to forecast perhaps how the Hylion solution can fit into their operations. I think it's important to note that Hylion right now does not have their Hypertruck ERX available uh, for mass scale. And it's important to note that you know, if they were able to garner a, a, a 20,000 truck order from Amazon, it would mean nothing right now. The stock would pop, yes, but could they fill that order? Would Amazon want 20,000 slots on the onset? No, of course not. They would want 200. Um, and, and it's whatever the OEMs can look to fill, but for a, a fleet that is as large as Amazon and some of the others, there will be certain percentages of the fleet that will be earmarked for electrification, uh, and to suggest the Hylion will not be involved in those discussions is pretty short-sighted in my mind, uh, and I think it could be a very costly one. If you're not looking at this opportunity, uh, perhaps you don't care about money. I don't know. That's, that's not up to me. Uh, I certainly do. Uh, I'm not investing in this company now. Uh, for um, what it is doing right now. I am investing in the company for what is expected to be an addressable market that's uh, projected to grow by 4.5% annually from now until 2025. Um, that's where I want to be. That's where I want my dollars to be. In an industry that we know that we have to rely on and have historically relied on for many, many decades past, but are looking forward in how we can clean up our shipping lines. And the Class 8 space knows this. And they know that they are exercising their opportunity to explore new technology, new innovative technology, and in Hylion's case, one that is practical, one that they don't have to change a whole lot. They get to keep their truck. They get to keep their Peterbilt. It's the exact same thing. They don't have to take chances uh, from a total perspective in you know, companies that have taken on this. this, this I'm going to uh, write myself in as an OEM like Nikola. And, and what do they know about building chassis? What, what, what type of rigor and over-the-road performance has been validated by a company like Nikola who's thinking that they're just going to step into the Class 8 fleet and dominate uh, right away? Um, I, I think that's pretty lofty. And, and I tell you what, if you notice here on this slide, the words are very, very few. You have to parse words to get to the intent of what Hylion is looking to, to communicate. But make no mistake about it, Hylion does a great job of communicating the truth from a conservative perspective. They are not, they were not, they, they will not lean into something to get into the presumptuous category. They will not. Um, they will state the facts as they see it. They will give progress. And I think there's a lot going on behind the scenes that is very exciting about this company that they will not comment on. 
They are very, very secretive about what's going on, what they're working on, what they're hearing from fleets, what they're looking to integrate in their technology as to what fleets want. And they provided uh, some real granularity around their approach in this. They are not one of those companies that is going to be presumptuous. And it's very telling to me when I read the earnings reports from a company like Nikola and Hylion, they read completely different, completely different. Nikola doesn't mind saying that they uh, anticipate all this stuff. And, well, you can anticipate anything under the sun. Hylion basically tells you what they've garnered and no more. They will not tell you any more um, to remain close to the vest because I think that they know that they've got the goods. And I think Thomas Healy knows that they've got the goods too. And they're going to continue to uh, march toward that end as slowly or as quickly as they are allowed to do, uh, but no more and no less. They're going to allow this thing to unfold in a natural state and take these wins, take the lumps where they need to, and they're going to allow this company to evolve because they know at the end they're going to be the ones standing when they enter into uh, commercialization and collaboration with the fleets that they serve. So appreciate you guys being with me and reviewing this uh, Q1 2022 earnings call. Let me leave you with a few final thoughts here on Hylion. Um, this company has um, really tested the uh, conviction of all investors. There's no doubt. There's not a lot of investors that have made money on this outside of the short sellers that have taken this thing from you know the $58 realm all the way to where we sit now uh, with this stock here at a very, very recessed stock price. Um, with that said, I, I really want you guys to take away the uh, opportunity that could exist here with the company. Um, the marked progress that we worked so hard to chronicle for Hylion, uh, and we do so on a consistent basis. It's super important that we continue to earmark uh, this prog pro uh, progress of the company as we march toward the inevitable commercialization. And when I say inevitable, I think a lot of people are writing this company off as if it's just not going to do anything. I think that's a big, big mistake. And there's not a lot of people out there uh, outside of a couple um, that I could think of off the top of their heads that aren't giving due credit for the progress that this company is uh, being being very open with sharing with investors uh, at this point. And I, I think it's going to be imperative upon investors to uh, stay the course. As this thing evolves, it's probably going to evolve in a way that neither you or me, bears nor bulls, can uh, uh, foresee. And if we can come to that agreement uh, that this company is going to unfold, they are going to find a small or large niche in the class eight space. Um, the capacity and the, uh, um, the degree of that impact is yet to be determined one sale at a time. But I think if you're going to uh, look at this company with conviction and look at it with the lens that I try to provide, I think you'll find that they are in a class of their own, uh, looking to exploit not only RNG and CNG on the onset, but also looking to segue into an agnostic uh, um, future and a fuel cell, uh, hydrogen fuel cell solution future, which I chalk up in one word as optionality. Optionality is key here, guys. And I think fleets know that. I think they're looking at this and saying, hold on a second, you're telling me that based on the market price of the fuel, I can choose what application I want in my fleet. Maybe we change out the fleets. Maybe we change certain trucks on certain routes to be more accommodative on certain routes um, where fuel costs were low in one category the prior year. Now things turn on its ear like they always do. Geopolitical risks kick up. And wouldn't it be great to provide these solutions to the industry that they serve uh, in an ability to make educated decisions about how they can save more on the bottom line by being provided these solutions that in turn provide optionality on the bottom line. That's what's so exciting about this opportunity. It's going to be great to continue to chronicle this story as it unfolds. Stand by for roles because this is about to get interesting. Once the momentum starts, if it hasn't started already, and it'll start when nobody presumes that it started, and it'll be going before anybody catches wind of it and those that are part of the uh part of the story 
uh, at times like this are the ones that will benefit the most. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message. Leave your comments at the bottom of the video. Give your, give your comments on what you think about the mandates on the direction of the company, whether or not you're a bull or a bear. Uh, be respectful with your comments to me. I don't have a lot of sympathy for people who want to come on uh, and just throw garbage my way without any intelligence thought. Uh, so think about what you say before you put it into the comment section, but I would invite you to subscribe to the message. Hit the thumbs up button if you like content like this. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.